You like to uh, look at those before and after pictures. Uh, you know, the, the gym where we work out, uh, every once in a while they'll have a display, and there's a before picture, and then an after, you know, those who signed up to be a part of a, you know, some kind of a, of a special exercise program, a fitness kind of a thing, and you know, you, you see the difference. Of course, um, when they take the before picture, they say, now look as dumpy and sad as you possibly can, and then uh, when they take the after picture, okay, suck in your gut and give a great big smile so that you look really good because that makes us look good. Well, or, or you see the pictures uh, or on TV, the guy, you know, there's no hair on his head and then he does the, the treatment and then he's got all this hair on top of his head. Oh, uh, before and after. What about uh, decorating in a home and remodeling? What did it look like before? Hey, what does it look like now? Boy, a great big change. Now, you know, the Bible has a lot of pictures of before and after. Now, these are not photographs, but these are more intimate than photographs. They are portraits of men and women whose lives have been changed because they responded to the call of God in their lives. Remember last week's message as Pastor Dreyer's talking to us about the call that God had on the life of Moses. It changed his life. It changed actually the history of Israel. It, it impacted what God was doing to bring salvation to the whole world. God used a, a guy who was a, a fugitive from justice, yeah, a murderer, and uh, someone who had, you know, he didn't have a decent job. He just worked for his father-in-law for 40 years. Well, God picked him. God chose him. You see, when God chooses someone, he wants to charge them and change them with power. Now, what we hope for to happen now in these minutes before us is that God will get a stronger grip on, on us so that we are embraced by his mission and that our vision is changed to be in focus with him. So let's walk through a few things. You got some, uh, uh, some notes there near you. Hope you pick them up and some, fun, some things you can fill in and some things that make it a little easier to follow the scriptures and then you can take them home with you and say, okay, and, and, and say, okay I'm gonna be uh, reviewing what it is that I, I learned this morning, in fact, through the whole week. And be ready for next week. Okay, the first thing is, are you, after the before and after, are you willing to, the A is the first letter in the word, assess. Assess what? Assess where you're at and what God may be intending to accomplish through you for his kingdom and for his glory. You know, it's that big question. What did God have in mind when he had me in mind even before time began? Did you know? He, he thought about you. <laughs> Personally, you know, I said, I'm going to make a special design because I'm going to have a special plan for that person and their life. So what did he have in mind in his first thought about you? Well, now let's move it forward to 2,000 years ago. We're back in time, okay? And uh, Jesus was out looking for followers. Where do you think he's going to go? Yeah, ziprecruiter.com, right? Try that, Jesus. <laughs> you know, they guarantee results the very first day. Well, Jesus didn't do that, but Jesus went to where real people were. Like he went to the shore of the Sea of Galilee. There he found Simon, who became Peter, and his brother Andrew, and James, and his brother John. And he just simply said, follow me. You know what they did? They left their nets, even left the big catch of fish. <laughs> And they followed him. And then he went down to the Jordan River where John had been baptizing. And uh, John points out, uh, hey, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he said to everybody, he must increase and I must decrease. And some of those followers of John took it literally and became disciples of Jesus. Well, he kept on. Now, where do real people hang on? I'm not looking for the good people. The fact is, he didn't go to the synagogue to recruit disciples, did he? But he went like to a tax collector booth. There was a guy, his name was Levi, also known as Matthew. Uh, Matthew was a, a tax collector, keeping books. And this guy who was keeping books would soon write a book we call the Gospel of Matthew. And he became a follower of Jesus. And then he went, uh, let's imagine a coffee house where all the political radicals get together to discuss and to debate politics. 
And there was a guy whose name was Simon the Zealot, <laughs> the radical. He says, hey, follow me. And he left his philosophy, political philosophies, and he followed Jesus because he was following something greater. Now, one of the examples is extremely outrageous, and that is a guy named Saul, and this is after the ascension of Jesus, but you know, Jesus didn't abandon, he kept on working even after the ascension. And there was a guy who was playing on the opposite team and playing hard, and it actually knocked a whole bunch of them out of the, uh, of the opponents out of the game. And Jesus said, you're gonna come with me, okay. So last week, Pastor Dreyer mentioned about the call of Moses changing his life. So there's a before and an after. From fishermen to ones who will now be catching fish. From a focus on fish to a focus on mission or a mind for mission, okay. And the future for these guys, they seem to think it was defined by their past, okay. Dad was a commercial fisherman. His dad was a commercial fisherman. His dad before that. I'm a commercial fisherman. My kids are gonna be commercial fishermen. That's just the way it goes. But God had something else in mind. They were so hemmed in by their thoughts and their assumptions, which even Christians typically can be. Instead of looking into the future and asking, okay, God, what do you have? I don't wanna be hemmed in. I don't wanna have my focus on the fish. I wanna have a mind for the mission. But let's stop and think about where do people typically get focused? They get focused. What are their passions? What are their causes? What's their focus? Some people try to focus on something really, really big. Like, I'm going to be part of some humane, you know, humongous thing. I'm going to join some kind of an organization that will save the planet, that will save the animals, save the whales, save the little baby seals, that will save, uh, but hey, we don't want to save the, all the uh, pre preborn children, okay. But they'll go after something like that, uh, put their, their money and their time and their energies into that because they want to save the world. And then probably the majority kind of go this way, don't bother me, <laughs> I got my own little life to lead here. I want to take the easy thing. Don't get me involved in some kind of a cause. But Christians ask always, what does God have in mind? Uh, have you identified that yet? What God has in mind for your life? Because, you know, God really does have something in mind for your life. And do you have in mind what God has in mind? That's the real question. But where, again, let's go back, where do people typically focus? You see, the, the sin nature has a focus, okay? This is the little sign. If you take your fingers, okay, curl them inward, make a fist like that. You know where it is? It's focused inward, curved inward into self. That is the natural, that is the, the state that uh, human beings are in. Preoccupation with our own emotions, our own interests, our own situation, that's human nature. Let's give a few examples of that, okay? Like, I like to call the shots. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, is that me? Yeah, ask my wife. Uh, I like to make everything a competition. I gotta win, I gotta win. Uh, I manipulate things to get my own way and seek to control the behavior of other people. You ever been thought of as a control freak? Well, you know some, don't you? Yeah. Knowing how to mask my uh, selfishness and then use charm and flattery to manipulate and sell you something. How about positioning to be at the center of attention? How about uh, being able to tailor the conversation to always come around to yourself. And then body language that says, <laughs> I'm bored and I'm uninterested in what you're talking about. So it's all self-focused, but that's not the only way. There's another side to that coin. So, you know, especially people that are very, very humble and they're so proud of that humility, okay, and which involves like, Self, low self-esteem, self-deprecation, undervaluing yourself, putting yourself down. You just don't want to appear conceited. And uh, you, you get the idea. That's also evidence of self-focus. It's not humility, but characteristics that flow out of the sin nature. And it's pretty tricky. You know how sin is? It, it tries to get us, you know, uh, even when we think we're going the right track, it uses that too to try to snare us into things. Well, there's a before and an after. 
We don't want to be, you know, captive to the sin nature, but be in tune with what God has in mind for us. Let's go to Paul, the apostle, whose name first was Saul, who experienced a major change of focus and mission. Originally, he saw his purpose in life is to get on the good side of God by obeying all the commandments and then looking for some more even to obey. The 613 commandments in the first five books of the Bible, he had them all down. He could number them. He could spell them out for you. Hey, what's number 329? And he could tell you what number 329 was. Like I used to be with the uh, Lutheran hymnal. Okay, I could tell you. You may say a number. I could tell you what the hymn title was. I was good at that. Uh, Okay, and I'm not proud of it anymore. Uh, (laughs) But... He was, he was proud of it. And then he could quote all the rabbis for any situation. He had all the degrees. He had uh, the, the background. He had the genealogy, everything. A Pharisee, he belonged to the right clubs, etc. But he later discovered that had nothing to do with making him right with God. Oh. This persecutor, chief persecutor of Christians became the chief proclaimer of Christ. Once he had an obsession, but now, but that, by the way, that never gave him any peace. It never gave him the sense of fulfilling his life's mission until literally the light came on, <laughs> on the road to Damascus, you know, that light from heaven, which changed him. First, he became blind in order that he might have a change of focus and be able to see. They had to lead him by the hand into Damascus, drop him off somewhere, and then God said to a guy by the name of Ananias, hey, go and visit. There's a man named Saul who is now praying. You go, and he's in a house on the street street called Straight. Go and tell him this. And then he said, this is what he told Saul, the God of our father. This is uh, Acts 22, okay? The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will. To see the righteous one, the one that he had persecuted, okay? Uh, And to hear a voice from his mouth, the mouth of Jesus. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. And you know what? He's got for every baptized person, (laughs) he's got a mission. He's got a mission. Now, Paul became a different man from then on. His, his, his vision, his focus, and his mission got realigned to be aligned with God's. And he became a disciple of Jesus Christ, gave his life all the way to his beheading for the sake of Jesus Christ, a new purpose, a new focus in life. Because he was taken up by something. Okay, you can fill in the blank there. Taken up by what? The word is mission, mission. You see, the disciple doesn't pick up a cause. The cause takes up the disciple. We do not take up a mission. The mission takes us. Big difference. But here, you don't have to quit your job. You don't have to sell your house, move to Africa, empty out your bank account and your retirement funds and give it all to the poor and then enroll in a seminary. But here's the question. If God would ask you to do that, would you do it? How long is it going to take you to get an answer to that? (laughs) Uh I know I'm messing with your mind, but that's because God's continually messing with our minds. But God is always willing to start where we are. And then the first thing that begins to happen is the lights start to go on. And then your passions, your desires, your preoccupations begin to change, and the focus begins to come on. Yeah, as you look behind me, yeah, the cross on Jesus. Jesus occupies more of our thoughts. Uh, he becomes the point of reference in all things. In other words, the focus changes. It sharpens up, and you begin to see yourself in a new light. You discover Or maybe you have to rediscover that God has a mission for you 
that is some way connected in an area of service and influence, starting in your own family, and then in the family of God, and then the ripples go out because he gives you, every one of us, a platform where we can impact and more significantly touch our world. That was that way with Paul. And along the way, he made that wonderful discovery of the Holy Spirit who was there all along and was much more powerful and uh, much more available than he realized, and I suspect more than all of us realize. Well, let's review some of the words of Paul himself that he wrote about his passion in life. We'll walk through a couple of these. Ones that we had read before, Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Him, that is Jesus, we proclaim. Warning, okay, how many? Everyone teaching Everyone with all wisdom that we may present. Everyone, how? He, he wants them to end up where they started? No. Where God says, this is where I want you to end up. Presenting everyone mature, fulfilled. You know, where, what it is that God created us for is more fully lived out. And he says, for this I struggle. I toil, struggling. What, with all my might? No, <laughs> with all his energy. That's the Holy Spirit. That he powerfully works within me. You see the change of focus. You see how far he's willing to go. You see the empowerment. And then we go into the next one. We're going to see it goes even a bit deeper. There's a profound change. Now, we talked a little bit about when he's writing to the Philippians here about all his bragging rights. Okay, so let's walk through that again. Philippians 3, 8 to 14. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth. I found something better. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake then, what happened? I suffered the loss of all those things and count them as rubbish. All the things that I took pride in beforehand, all my degrees and all my achievements, all my memorization, in order that I may gain Christ. What are you let, willing to let go to have more of Christ in you? He must increase, I must decrease. Be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, you know, by my attainment, my works, my deal, my, comes from the law, but what comes instead, not by my performance, but just simply by faith, by trust in Jesus Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him, not just know about him, but know him. Not just having the information, but the formation of my character. The power, which is the power of his resurrection. Sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so that I may be like him, attain the, the resurrection. Like him in his resurrection from the dead. It says, not that I've already attained, obtained this, or am already perfect, but I press on. I press on. I don't get discouraged because I'm not there yet because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I didn't make him my savior. He made me his child. Oh, yeah. And then, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. Okay? Now underline the next part. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. What lies behind? Oh, well, all the failures, all the fashions, all the fads, okay? And then straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. I, I'm, I'm just putting it all on what he has in mind for me. The high calling, you see. The, the, the call of the disciple you know, involves a new focus, a new mission. So, is God working in your life? Well, you know what? He is. Sometimes we don't like to acknowledge it, but rather ignore it, because it can be a little bit uncomfortable at times because he's going to you know, correct us and <laughs> start fixing us up. You know, leave it alone, leave it alone. But he's looking for people who have these three characteristics. All right? On your notes, you see an F, and then there is an A, and there is a T. Mm -hmm. And skinny people can apply as well. Okay. The question is the, about the, the F, the faithful. Okay. The A is available 
and the T is teachable. Can God count on you? Are you faithful? So just for fun, how would you rate yourself on a scale of one to five? A one would be, ha, 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 are you kidding? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't have time for that. You know, I'm, I'm way too young. I'm way too old. I'm way too middle-aged. My kids are way too young. My kids are way too old. My kids are too demanding. My life, my job is way too demanding. Uh, I've got all these other commitments I got to, you know, isn't that a, an interesting way of, uh, you know, expressing our unfaithfulness to God, but, you know, we, we will tend to do that. I've done that, all right? Uh, a five would be, hey, whatever and whenever I can be used by God and he wants me, I'm there. No questions asked. I don't have to say, well, what is it? I just say, here am I, okay? When God called Isaiah, basically God said this, uh, hey, I'm looking for someone who will uh, serve me regardless of the danger, regardless of the cost, uh, something that, uh, you know, it's going to be a difficult, dangerous, and unrewarding job, and he pops right up and he says, here am I, send me. You know, God can use someone like that, somebody who is faithful, and then somebody who is available, yeah, and um, he can make a great church. If we're not faithful and not available, <laughs> Good luck, good luck. So are you willing to trash your schedule for his? I'm not talking about being irresponsible in the daily pursuits of life. That's where God calls us when we're doing the duty, fulfilling just every day the Ten Commandments in our lives. But responding to God's legitimate claim upon us, if we are available, we can be used. How about teachable? T, the teachable. How, how much did the disciples know when Jesus, you know, got these, these 12? What did they know? Did he uh, say, okay, you got to have a certain number of degrees before you can serve me? No. You're not going to focus on fish anymore. You're going to have a mind on the mission. You're not going to keep books for, as, as a tax collector. You're going to write a book. <laughs> no. He's, he, he took them. They, they, they would seem to be eminently unqualified, and yet because they were teachable, okay? If we're teachable, yeah. And not just getting more information, but again, the formation. The Great Commission does not say, and teach them all that I have commanded you, is teach them an attitude, teach them to obey, to observe everything that I have commanded you. So it's an attitudinal kind of a thing. That's where learning really begins. And then we begin to pick up some of the skills and some of the background and some of the knowledge. And the more we focus ourselves on Scripture, the more it just has this amazing power to develop our focus and to put us you know, mission-minded. So no longer the focus on fish, but the mind on the mission, becoming his disciples and his followers. If we're teachable... We can be used by God. What if God would gather together a bunch of people and says, you're going to be a blazed church, <laughs> and uh, regardless of what you have in the background, it really doesn't matter, but if you are faithful, available, and teachable, boy, I can do something incredible. I can build a great church. He didn't say a big church. Great church. And that's what he's after. You know, God has a plan. Ready? Shovel ready for every one of us. God has created each one of us very intentionally, and God wants every one of us to be a part of what he is up to. So right now, God is waiting. How long does he have to wait for you? If we catch on, then look out, devil.